Also, when I'm making something like a platter, I don't worry about getting it all the way centered at this point. I get it probably 90% of the way there, but then I go ahead and open the platter, and when it's a, a ring around the edge is when I do the fine tuning on the centering. Always test the thickness before I open this all the way because it's a lot easier to make adjustments now. plate or a platter, I always try to, to make the bottom not exactly flat, I throw up just the slightest curvature because I've learned that if, it's, if I throw it absolutely uh, flat and straight across, sometimes in the drying process it'll warp up on the inside. and. If I throw it with just the slightest curvature, it forms a like a reverse dome, and so it won't it won't ever uh, warp up past that level spot because of the dome. The thickness of the bottom is crucial. You know, if you make it just a little bit too thick across the whole bottom, it ends up being kind of a of a clunky thick piece. Unlike a, a vertical pot with a small bottom where the bottom doesn't really mean a whole lot. It really is almost everything. It's about 80% of the pot on a platter. So I go to great lengths to, to get the curve right on the bottom and to, and to make sure that it's that it's the profile and and thickness on that. Cracking always occurs in the drying. Sometimes they're uh, S-cracks and sometimes they're circular cracks. And so I've gone to great lengths to, to try to dry them slowly. And I've also done a, quite a bit of experimenting with clay to try to come up with the right clay body. Currently, my clay body of choice for platters is uh, Babu porcelain by Laguna. And it's named after Victor Babu, who, who was who taught for a, a career at the Kansas City Art Institute and made chargers this big around. So he was uh, used to drying very large porcelain pieces, and it does seem to dry much better than my the other porcelain clays that I that I work with. When I throw platters on an absorbent bat within 24 hours, they usually pop off, and they dry much more evenly. The interior gets to the leather hard stage about the same time frame that the rim does. And before I threw on on uh, plaster bats, I was it was always a fight to get them to dry. The bottom's formed, the walls are being raised, and, and I'm starting to think about the rim. Right now it's got much more height than I'm after. Uh, down here is pretty much, uh, or nearly thinned out. But I'm going to start compressing the rim and flattening the rim, making it wider at this point. And 
I'm actually going to use my left hand to make kind of a C shape and it's kind of like a C clamp and and that supports the wall underneath and also supports the underneath side of the rim and then I will spread with my right hand. So the obvious thing I'm doing is the spreading with my right hand by pressing down with my right index finger. But the, the hero of the story really is what's happening with, with my left fingers underneath because it, it supports the rim and it also uh, keeps the, the wall from collapsing underneath. So this is kind of where my hands are at this point. I'm pressing down with my right hand and against uh, the rim which is resting on top of my thumb here. Another thing that's really always going to happen with platters is no matter how carefully you dry them, the, the rim will dry somewhat faster than the, than the base. And so one thing that that means is that as the rim starts to dry and starts to shrink, it will actually raise in the process as it's shrinking. And so I want to make sure that the platter is flattened out quite a bit because uh, I don't ever want the rim to pull up too far. Trusty Kemper S4 scraper is my most used tool. It's a tool I do most all my shaping with and whenever I make linear marks I often use the corner here and that's what I'm going to be using on this rim. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little bead along that inner rim which just adds a little definition. And then after I get that that bead formed then I pull the rib across to kind of give that trail off line. And so sometimes at this point the rim is starting to get a little wobbly uh, starting to risk, be at risk of, of falling. Uh, this one, I'm fortunate, this one feels fairly stable. But if, if it was feeling too unstable, I'd put some heat on it. In fact, I think I will anyway. Quartz can be incredibly valuable when you're using it in a situation like this. It can also uh, be, I, I use it uh, in a lot of different situations on a lot of different kinds of pots, but probably about as valuable here as anywhere. In the interior of the pot and the rim and I'm going to create kind of a, a four-sided division on this inner rim and it's going to uh, end up being four uneven lengths of, of um, linear uh, movement and I, I start with my my finger here and I run it down the inside and then I let it kind of go into the the rim as if a tire going into a snowbank. And so this is going to be the smallest side. Maybe a longer side here.
So what I'm thinking about here is creating rhythm. And by having, if I had four evenly divided segments, uh, it would be a, a very predictable rhythm. And by having uneven divisions, it gives me, I think, a little more dynamic movement. So that's the first part of the alteration. The second part involves making a line from the point of where I, my finger dug into the, to the rim out to the edge. It's kind of the line that connects the two sculpturally. And so I, I press it in and pull the rib off to the side so it kind of makes a, uh, an alteration in the form as opposed to just putting a, a line on the pot. And then the last thing I do to the rim is I actually want the rim to undulate up and down in relationship to this series of, of lines. So I raise the rim. This is where the heat really helps out. I raise it and it kind of stays in position. I raise it on the beginning of that line and then let it swoop down. So up and then down. Up and then down. And so now when you view this from the side, it creates kind of an undulating line. You know, I always, I always try to think of, of pots as being three-dimensional sculptural objects, which means that how they exist in space from all different angles is important. So how the pot looks from this angle, to me, is almost as important as how it looks when you're looking straight down. It's been mixed to a a homogeneous state, you know, something kind of the thickness of a milkshake. And I just scoop it onto the inside of the platter with my hand. I also do this a lot on vertical pieces. And on vertical pieces, it's, it's almost impossible to get too much because it, it falls off. Uh, it falls off with gravity. On a plate like this, or a platter, uh, you can fill it up and it will actually uh, always cause the pot to crack if you get it on too thick. So it's been a challenge for me to find the, the thickness I want to work with because uh, the thicker the slip is, the more I like the lines, but the, the thicker the slip is, the more at risk the platter is for cracking. It's also the same thing I use on a vertical piece, but the on a vertical piece, uh, I'm really creating um, a situation where I'm trying to interact with gravity to make an interesting drip. On the platter, I'm making a very direct mark, something that, that uh, is my mark, and gravity holds it in place in this case. So I've learned that, that I don't really want it to be, uh, it's a spiral, but I don't really want it to be symmetrical. So I... Do something like that. Dimension between the thinnest and the thickest part of the slip, that's always the most vulnerable spot for the slip causing the pot to crack. I've, I've seen cracks go all the way through the pot that are caused by the variation in surface tension between the thick and the thin. But I'm hoping that if I dry this one out slowly enough that it will survive because I really like the, the mark.